Thank you guys for coming. My name is Reginald Dwayne Betts. <laughs> and, um, Shahid. Shahid. <laughs> and you are all here for the Inside Literary Prize. By way of announcement, I just want to say that this is a remarkable occasion. We have a standing room only audience. And this whole enterprise started because of an article that was published in the New York Times Magazine. Our partners, the Center for Justice Innovation, I'm Lori Feathers, the owner of an independent bookstore, and the National Book Foundation reached out to me after reading an article in the New York Times Magazine about a, in, a prize in France that was judged by people who were currently incarcerated. It is the biggest prize in France. And one of the ways that you show that you care about people is to allow them to have an active part in civic engagement. If the Gutenberg printing press is our greatest creation, then that means that literature is our greatest testimony. And the people who say what matters and what is to be valued are our greatest treasure. And if you choose to decide that people in prison don't matter, then you are choosing maybe to argue that redemption is impossible. The France Prize says that redemption is not only possible, but even without redemption, you can play an active role in a community and in a society. The partners reached out to me, and a year later, Freedom Reads, the Center for Justice Innovation, Lori Feathers, and the National Book Foundation bring you here to the New York Public Library, which, by any measure, is the pinnacle of literary excellence in America. And we are here to celebrate the award-winning authors, Tess Guntry, who wrote Rabbit Hunch. She is the youngest winner of the National Book Award. Youngest doesn't really matter as much these days, because one of these days, we will be saying that she is the oldest living winner of the National Book Award. <laughs> we are also here to honor Imani Perry, the author of South to America. While others will say things about writers, I just want to say that each one of these writers has touched the lives of people I know in prison personally. Amani's no different. We're here to celebrate Roger Reeves, author of Best Barbarian. I've known Roger since I was 24 years old and just out of prison. The fact that we are here today with him being honored and me emceeing means that I have radically failed as a rapper. <laughs> and he has excelled as a poet. <laughs> and we are also honoring Jamil Kocha. I often wonder what it means to be a product of American literature. We think about Faulkner. We think about Baldwin. Baldwin. We think about Morrison. I don't know how much we talk about the work of people who are immigrants to this country, people whose families live in other countries as they write and persevere here. Jamil is such a person. And, and I was really um, taken listening to men say, I never knew anything about the world that Jamil writes about until I read The Haunting of Haji Hotek. The point is, as I end and we move towards a, a media compilation from the tour, is that over six states and 12 prisons and 300 judges we watched people spend time thinking about these books, talking about these books. Our team, many of whom are here today, went into more prisons than most people in this country will ever claim having spent time in. And they watched it all. And I thank you for coming to celebrate it. And without further ado, I want to make one final note before we watch the video. This literally was impossible without a thousand people. I am just fortunate to be standing up here, but there are so many people involved, people who are serving life in prison, who committed themselves to read four books in a completely abridged amount of time and make themselves vulnerable. There are people on our team who have never been in a prison before and went into a prison time and time again, waiting sometimes hours to enter. And you leave weeping, because if you leave a prison without tears, maybe you weren't paying as much attention as you might. Without further ado, let's look at what happened on the tour. 
sharing a love of literacy behind bars. This is the proposal now behind the events this week at two Minnesota prisons. This group of 25 incarcerated women together as judges for the National Inside Literary Prize. Inside Literary Prize is bringing 300 incarcerated folks together to judge the best book. We were giving four different books to read and to judge on them from our perspective and our opinions. I love literature, I love reading, I love learning. Um, it's taught me a lot. I think for us, reading is kind of a way of life in here. I mean, I walk and read a book because I don't want to, I don't want to get involved in you know, anything bad. I want to stay on my track. Um, the books kind of help us do that. It's actually kind of nice to think that other people care about what inmates have to say. It's not like we're inmates, it's we're people. This opportunity has allowed all of us to kind of come together and share our perspectives and our points of view. We've heard things from the judges about this, like it makes me feel um, more human. It connects me to people that's in here in a way I hadn't been connected to them before. I know I don't like to be looked at like, the only thing I can do is something that's bad. I want to show that I can do something good. Because when we come out, and those of us that are getting out, we want to do better in life, you know? So we're doing something in here. This is a redemption project that everybody is worthy of mercy. One of the goals we had was to make people who aren't writers jealous. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, writers win awards all the time, and if you know any writers, those awards are in closets. They are. <laughs> if they come with a cash prize, the significance of the cash prize is how hefty the cash prize is. We build libraries in prison, handmade, walnut, maple, cherry, oak. We wanted the Inside Literary Prize to represent the reason why these partners, our August partners, decided to work with us. And so Jay Jonas, Shannon, and Dan, um, they cut every, every part for the libraries that we built. And they also, um, I always pronounce I always pronounce Dan's father's name incorrectly, and, and I hate to do it at this moment, so I'm just going to say Shannon, Dan, and Dan's father, who's a brilliant <laughs> artist, <laughs> built this, though. And, and you look at this, and whoever wins this award, if they don't put it on their wall, I'm going to steal it. But, <laughs> but if you look, the top and the bottom are two halves of the Inside Literary Prize logo. The top is created with sparsed maple. It's reclaimed wood. And the idea is that when, when we do this work, we are acknowledging that you could build beauty out of what was once suffering. You could build beauty out of what was once abandoned. And so that, that sculptural piece is, um, is produced by Jay Jarnas, and it is beautiful. It is a testament to what literature can do. And uh, um, the three individual awards that will go to the runner-ups, they were built by our team in Louisiana, men who served up to 25 years in Angola. And they made those with their hands to represent what it means to enliven a place uh, with beauty and literature. And with that said, the way that tonight's proceeding, um, proceedings will go forward, each of the writers will get um, introduced and they'll give brief remarks. And then ultimately, we will find out who won. <laughs> I should say that I think the person who wins gets a prize <laughs> in addition to this. But I shall save the narrative of the prize for later because I think it should get a singular moment in this discussion. So first, I am delighted to introduce Tess Gunty. One of the great honors of this is you get to hear what people think about books. I heard Rabbit Hutch so many times. <laughs> I mean, people loved it. They loved the characters. They wanted to talk about the decisions that were being made. And more importantly, they wanted to remind us that the lives in that book reflected the lives that they have lived, which is one thing that we don't hear enough of. We think that the lives of those in prison is reduced to the crimes that may have led them there, but it's not. And listening to them talk about your book reminded us of that. And I ain't even going to front. I love how many awards you won. You, <laughs> for real. I mean, translated into a dozen, a dozen languages, hablo espanol, not a mas. You know? And, and you got the Barnes & Noble Discovery Prize. The Waterstones Debut Fiction Prize. Waterstones is a bookstore in London, if you don't know. Big deal, international. The VCU Cabell First Novelist Award, and many, many others. But what means the most to me, and I say this with all respect to every judge for any of these awards, 
is men and women who may die in prison found deep, deep meaning in the words that you wrote. And that is a testament to why we do this work, more than any award we may ever be given. So I thank you for your work. Um, I'm really overwhelmed with awe and gratitude for everyone who made the Inside Literary Prize possible. And um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to express a bit about that. Um, first and foremost to the readers across the country who bestowed their transformative and singular attention on our work. Um, I thank them for, um, for kind of finishing what we started. I don't believe that any book is finished until it meets the imagination of another person. And so by reading my book, they brought it to life. And um, that is, to me, the most sacred collaboration on earth. Oh, I hope everyone's OK. Um, <laughs> And of course, to my fellow shortlistees, Amani, Roger, and Jamil, who's not here with us, um, thank you for writing some of the most stunning and important books of our time. It's an honor to be to read your books, to be changed by your books, and to find my my book among among yours. And then, finally, to Freedom Reads, the National Book Foundation, Lori Feathers prison librarians across the country, and the Center for Justice Innovation, thank you for seeing literature as a force of escape and confrontation, remedy and revolution. Thank you for treating access to literature as a human right. I am in awe of your commitment to protecting and nourishing freedom of the mind in spaces where every other freedom has been taken away. Thank you for amplifying the voices that structures around us try to silence. My writing is guided by a longing to abolish hierarchies of domination and replace them with regenerative, mutualistic ecosystems of care. But I am aware of the limitations of my chosen craft. Uh, as someone who spends most of her time describing imaginary people and their imaginary experiences, it is radically humbling to be in a room full of people who are devoted to making the real world more just. That is tireless and difficult work. I want to say to everyone who communicates, who chooses restoration over punishment, liberation over confinement, you are the heroes of our species. You are the heroes of this story. By fighting to establish a land of the truly free, you have made this into a home of the truly brave. I want to be more like you when I grow up. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this, and may we continue to fight for care, not cages. Um, in an effort to keep this moving, I will save my tears for later. <laughs> I want to invite uh, Lori Feathers um, to, the, to the stage. And, and I will say one thing. Um, you know, ultimately, a lot of this work is, is really about the way in which you say that you believe in it. And, um, and money is never the most important thing that anybody could give. Uh, but my first job was at an independent bookstore. And of the people who are not wealthy, owners of independent bookstores are at least six on the list. <laughs> and when we decided, and I'll just say it now so you know, when we decided that the award for this prize would be a cash prize that is the equivalent of what I earned in prison and what Luke earned in prison and what Mike earned in prison, what Kevin earned in prison, and what Jermaine earned in prison, what Alex earned in prison, 54 cents an hour, if it took you five years to write this book. The cash prize is the equivalent of 54 cents an hour for 1,800 hours, and I get that it often takes more than that to write a book. But I also know that when Lori Feathers donates half of the money for this prize, she is saying more than the writing that the authors did matters. She's actually saying that the lives of the men, women, and children inside who are moved by that work matters. And the reason why I know this 
is because shortly after we left Missouri, one of the judges for the Inside Literary Prize donated $1,000 mm. to this work. Mm. And, um, and I think that he is in your company. So I invite Lori to the stage. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's, um, words can't really express what this means after um, just a, a lot of hard work by a lot of people here. Um, Dwayne mentioned a little bit about how this all got started. I'll very briefly um, summarize just um, the, the way that the journey kind of happened for me. Um, as Dwayne said, on December 16, 2022, the New York Times ran an article about the inmates Goncourt in France, a prize for books in which a jury of inmates meet to choose a winner among the finalists of France's most um, esteemed literary prize. I was so inspired by the idea that I emailed my friend Greg Berman, who's here in the audience, um, and he um, is a fellow at a senior fellow at the Center for Justice Innovation. And I asked him in the email if he thought this was something that could ever be implemented in the US. It seemed quite a quixotic kind of idea. And um, I'll save all the details, but um, here we are. And I, I, want to, um, I want to just talk a little bit about the three organizations that have joined forces to bring about this this wonderful prize. Um, Freedom Reads, the Center for Justice Innovation, and the National Book Foundation. Um, they cannot be lauded enough. Their dedication, commitment, stamina, and insight in recognizing the value of each incarcerated person and the pivotal role of the written word to provide hope, empathy, and foster potential has been truly awe-inspiring and extraordinary. The Inside Literary Prize is not only a means to elevate the role of books to inspire and move those in prison. We know that prisoners very often are great readers, but it's a vehicle for giving autonomy and agency to our incarcerated brothers and sisters. This award says that you have value, your ideas and thoughts are worthy of consideration, that you merit our attention. I witnessed this firsthand when I joined the Freedom Reads team at the Faribault Men's Correctional Facility to meet with judges for the prize. The discussions that we had about the books, about our life experiences, and our future as a country were truly awe-inspiring, and I will never forget it. As we celebrate the Inside Literary Prize on the eve of this 100th anniversary of James Baldwin's birth, I want to share a quote that I found particularly resonant. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, all the people who had ever been alive. <coughs> And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Jamal Jean Kochai, author of The Haunting of Haji Hotuk and Other Stories, a finalist for this year's Inside Literary Prize. And I think that um, Jamal is joining us by video. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Jamal Jean Kochai here in my office in West Sacramento, California. I'm the author of The Haunting of Haji Hotuk and Other Stories, and it's such a tremendous honor to be nominated for the Inside Literary Prize, along with the other incredible nominees. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you all, but I want to thank the judges, the organizers of tonight's event, Freedom Reads, the National Book Foundation, and the Center for Justice Innovation for making this prize possible. I think this is such a beautiful and necessary initiative and I hope that our literary institutions continue to support and advocate for the incarcerated writers and readers in our wider literary community. I'll end my remarks for the evening by reading a passage from my short story, The Haunting of Haji Otak. 
this is actually the last page of the story. So if you haven't read it yet, um, plug your ears. <clears throat> Haji becomes relentless. He searches for you on the phone, in the streets, in unmarked white vans, in the faces of policemen, detectives in street clothes, military personnel, and his own neighbors. He searches for you at the hospital, at the bank, on his computer, his son's laptops, in webcams, phone cameras, and on the television. He searches for you in the curtains and in the drawers of the kitchen and in the trees in his backyard, in the electrical sockets, in the locks of the door handles, and in the filaments of the light bulbs. And even as his family protests, Haji searches for you in shattered glass, in broken tile, in the strips of his wallpaper, the splinters of his doors, his tattered flesh, his warped nerves, and in his own beating heart, where, through it all, the voice whispering that he is loved is yours. Yo, that was that was good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it reminds me that the bomb that we need to most move us to action, and it reminds us why action is needed, is quite often in literature. And um. And what's beautiful about this day is it reminds me that literature consists of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Because as John Edgar Wyman once said, all lies are true. You know, I actually didn't think people involved with the legal system, lawyers, I hate to say I'm a lawyer, oof. I didn't think that lawyers read books. And then the Center for Justice Innovation said, we would love to have you on our podcast. I was like, to talk about what? And they said poetry. <laughs> and I was like, for real? And this is why I know when Courtney Bryan comes to the stage and talks about the work for the Center for Justice Innovation, she understands, as her organization understands, that justice is principally related to how you hear that voice. Courtney. Oh, Duane, you are one of us. You're a lawyer now. Um, and I'm a lawyer who reads books. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to be with you today. I just uh, am thrilled and uh, grateful to uh, all of the folks who have been part of this effort, including our team at the Center for Justice Innovation. You know who you are. Uh, Greg Berman, who um, is my uh, predecessor and my friend and, and mentor, and it's wonderful to see what uh, a small world this is, you know, the connections that are made over, over time and, and space. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the center and why we believe the Inside Literary Prize is so important and special. At the center, we work in New York and across the country to build what we call community justice. That means we work with communities and systems uh, to not only make the legal system more just, but to also ensure that communities can be safe with as few people as possible going into the system. Our goal is to foster healing over harm, to partner directly with communities and the people most impacted, and most importantly, to build safe, healthy, equitable communities. When Lori first approached our team about creating a literary prize judged by people who are incarcerated, my first thought was, while we do produce a lot of words, and our comms team is sitting over here, I can see, uh, um, research, policy briefs, social posts, um, and lots of us, of course, at the center love reading books, um, a literary prize was really outside of our usual scope. But the answer really suddenly became obvious. Books bring people together. Literature builds bridges. It elevates the voices of those who are too often overlooked or ignored. That's why we do uh, what we do. So the Inside Literary Prize is a celebration of ideas, of hope, and humanity. And that's why my, it's my great privilege to introduce Imani Perry. 
Imani Perry is the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. She is the New York Times bestselling author of a, and the Inside Prize finalist for South to America, a journey below the Mason-Dixon to understand the soul of the nation. She too has written a lot of books who've received prizes. <laughs> Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, Breathe, A Letter to My Sons, Vexy Thing on Gender and Liberation, and May, and May We Forever Stand, A History of the Black National Anthem. Perry's a native of Birmingham, Alabama, who grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Chicago, and lives outside of Philadelphia. I happened to meet Dr. Perry um, at another event just a few months ago. She was the commencement speaker at a graduation event for the College and Community Fellowship, an organization here in New York City that works with formerly incarcerated women to help support them through higher, uh, in, attain higher education. When she got up to, sp to speak at this small venue, actually it was a large kind of venue, but a small audience, um, she said, while she'd been the commencement speaker at a number of universities, and I Googled, and saw, they include Georgetown, <laughs> Wesleyan, I think. Um, she said that this was the most treasured and important invitation that she received. She spoke with remarkable humility and warmth and poignancy. I too am a daughter of the South, the American South, and I share uh, Dr. Perry's wise observation that you must understand the South to understand America. Please welcome Dr. Perry. Oh, um, this is such uh, an extraordinary honor. And the way I'm going to express it, I, I am so grateful to all of the people who spent time um, with um, all of these, all of these books, um, making this award possible, most of all to the readers inside. But I want to express my gratitude with um, one detail, which is um, tomorrow morning I will be on a plane at 5:30 a.m. Um, for uh, the funeral service for my cousin Dwayne who was so close to me that he was, he was like uh, a brother to me. And um, my family is already gathered, um, but I, I, I just couldn't miss this evening. It's so precious. Um, I've spent much of the last 14 years of my life in active grief, um, and this particular prize um, is deeply connected to the nature of that grief, and I won't go into much more detail, but um, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude. Um, when I decided to write South to America, I knew I had to address the reality of a nation that from its very beginning proclaimed liberty but held human beings captive. As someone born in Alabama, meaning I was born into a region where prisons literally sit on the grounds of slave plantations, where incarcerated people work hard for the same pittance amounting to nothing that sharecroppers once did, meant that to tell the story of my home truthfully required me to address prisons, but more importantly, people who were once prisoners, from a plethora of blues singers to the Italian social theorist Antonio Gramsci to Malcolm X, Richard Mufundi Lake, Angela Davis, Fannie Lou Hamer, Owusu, Yaki, Yakubu, and more have been intellectual and spiritual guides for me. In South to America, I wrote about one of them, the late Johnny Imani Harris, and I want to share some of those words here. In 1970, Johnny Harris's family moved into a white neighborhood in Birmingham. Johnny Harris's block had white cops living on it. They didn't like integration and didn't traffic in symbolic hatred. They dealt in vengeance. One day he was arrested while going to work. Harris was shoved into a lineup and told by the cops that if he didn't confess to three nighttime robberies and a rape charge against a white woman, more cases would be put on him. Despite having a long list of alibis, Harris's court-appointed attorney convinced him to plead guilty in their first meeting. 
He was convicted and sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. He was sent to Atmore Home in prison down near Mobile. In the first few years of the 1970s, Johnny Harris became politically conscious and organized a prison union called Inmates for Action. The newspapers of that period called the protests led by Johnny Harris and Richard Mufundi Lake at the Atmore Home in prison, Alabama's Attica. The prisoners tired of or ignored petitions to the public and the courts explaining the phys physical abuse they suffered inside staged a 100% effective work stoppage. While sugar cane rotted in the fields, the prison administration tried to defeat the strike with every tool at their disposal. They threatened mass punishment, pointing their guns at the prisoners sitting down in the yard. The prisoners held firm. They tried to divide the white prisoners from the black. The prisoners remained unified. Finally, they beat, transferred, and isolated over 300 inmates, hoping to disperse the, quote, ringleaders. The protests turned into a rebellion. A guard was killed. The rebels were expected to pay. Johnny Harris was placed in solitary confinement, a vicious barracoon. Then he took the name Imani, which means faith in Swahili. As a child, I used to speak to Imani on the phone. He called collect. His voice was scratchy through the heavy black receiver. He reminded me to mind my parents and to be good in school over the choppy line. He told me once that my name inspired him to change his and not to forget it. He was from Birmingham like me. He was locked up. I was up north. When he was finally released in 1991, he said it was talking to children that allowed him to keep it together after so many years. He's gone now, but perhaps the most memorable part about him was, despite everything, the beauty of his smile. Thank you. You, you actually don't, um, I mean, honestly, when you come to an award ceremony, if you cry at all, you're supposed to cry because, uh, because you're happy for the winner. Um, but what I found has been a, a consistent theme in the last year of doing this work is that the tears don't come from how brilliant the writers are. It literally comes from how transformative the stories are. And I mean, in some ways, um, that does start with one of the major literary organizations of this country, the National Book Foundation, committing to be a part of this. And I think the value of that is, is more than whatever prize gets given. It is saying that we, as a major cultural institution in the United States, believe the value, the critical value of the voices of people in prison will matter to this country and to the writers. And unfortunately, Ruth couldn't consult the writers before we did this. She just had to believe that it would matter to whoever was chosen as a finalist. And that it has mattered to everybody. Say something about the National Book Foundation and everybody who has been a part of the National Book Foundation, from Lisa Lucas, to Ruth Dickey, to Natalie, who I've known probably longer than all of them. I mean, this has been literally a labor of love that did not just start with this project, and I want to say this. It started with everybody who comes to the stage believing far longer than we started this that this mattered. Ruth. What an extraordinary honor it is to be here tonight with all of you all for the culmination of this long-held dream. Um, huge, huge thanks to the wonderful people and partners at Freedom Reads and the Center for Justice Innovation and Lori Feathers who dreamt up and made this collaboration possible. Thank you all for your innovation, your enthusiasm, and careful connecting of National Book Award honored titles and authors with readers across the country. And thanks to everyone who's here tonight to join in the celebration of the inaugural year of these efforts. This November, we're gonna be celebrating 75 years of the National Book Awards, and we're really proud of that history and of continuing to build together with all of you the most impactful and inclusive awards program possible. We take our work as a national organization 
really seriously, and we work year-round to reach readers everywhere through our education and public programs. This means we give away free books and present free events at public libraries, public housing communities, schools, and with thanks to our long-running partnership with Freedom Reads in prisons. In 2018, we were lucky to receive support from the Art for Justice Fund, a sponsored project of the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors in partnership with the Ford Foundation to launch Literature for Justice. In the first year of that program, we honored Shahid Reads His Own Palm, a poetry collection by the one and only Dwayne Betts. The following year, we had the good fortune of Dwayne serving as a committee member, and we've been building together ever since, from book distributions and book circles with incarcerated readers to the Inside Literary Prize. So, so many thanks are due to Dwayne, Lori, Dan, Ivan, Madeline, Stephen, David, Catriona, and all the extraordinary humans we've worked with at Freedom Reads and CJI for allowing us to join in on this special one-of-a-kind initiative, which is truly our honor. Also, huge thanks to Ale Romero, Emily Lovett, Madeline Shelton, and Natalie Green from National Book Foundation for their hard work to bring this collaboration to life. Yeah. <laughs> It is truly a gift to expand the makeup of our judges to include some of the most thoughtful readers and writers that we've met who also happen to be incarcerated and to work together to foster conversation around exceptional books and writers, especially the four talented humans whose work makes up the Inside Literary Prize's inaugural shortlist, Tess Gunty, Jamil Jan Kochai, Imani Perry, and Roger Reeves. Without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce Roger, the author of the poetry collections King Me and Best Barbarian, a National Book Award finalist and winner of the Griffin Poetry Prize and Kingsley Tuft Award for Poetry, and the essay collection Dark Days, Fugitive Essays. A Harvard Radcliffe Institute Fellow, Roger is the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, and a 2015 Writing Award, among many other honors. Roger is joining us from Austin, Texas. Thank you for being here, Roger. I had to check my watch. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, which means we, I could go on forever. <laughs> so I had to check it, you know. Um, I had prepared remarks, and then I talked with Dwayne today, and he told me, he was like, tell that story. <laughs> so I'm going to just tell y'all a story, which is rare because I'm a lyric poet. We don't be telling stories. Um, but this prize reminded me of something that I hadn't thought about in probably about 10 years. You have to go back to 2004. I was a graduate student at Texas A&M University, which is uh, central Texas. And there was a little town, there's two little towns, twin cities if you want to call them that. There's Bryan and College Station. And two other friends and I decided we wanted to start a open mic at this little sort of hole in the wall, hippie bar, and Brian. And we started our open mic, and originally it was just kind of us doing every poem. But eventually we started getting people coming in and coming in. And I remember there was a young man came in, I was young too <laughs> at the time, and he signs up on the list. And this is back in the day when you had to put your name on the list. And he signs it T I H S P S P E D. And I'm, you know, poets, we like to have names. And so I go up to the young man and I say, brother, what's, what's your name? You know, what's the name on the list? He said, that's Ta Speed. Ta Speed. I said, okay. I just need to know how to say it when I get up to the mic. And he said to me, he kind of whispered to me, he said, um, I'm about to go to prison. I've been sentenced and I'm just trying poetry before I go. It was like, and he kind of was asking for permission. I was like, okay, get up here on this mic. And I remember Ta Speed getting up to the mic. 
and performing his poem. It was a short poem, and he was nervous, and he almost whispered it. But I could tell he liked it. He liked delivering poetry to people. And so I, before he left, I said, hey, man, that was a good poem. Come back. He's like, for real? I was like, yeah. So week in and week out, he would come back. And I'd get to know Taspi. And Taspi was um, convicted of selling lots of drugs. I'll put it like large amounts of them. And they delayed his sentence for a year. And so every Sunday, Taspi would come in. Eventually, I say to him, Ta, what is this name? And he was like, it's deep shit backwards. That's what I bring. <laughs> So, <laughs> so very few people knew that that's what Taz V was. So I, that was a little thing between, and so I was like, okay. But week in and week out, Ty would come in, his poems were getting longer, we'd work on poetry. And then he also had this passion for cooking. So he would say to me, he'd be like, hey man, let me cook for you. Let me cook for you. I'd be like, all right, cool, I'm a graduate student, I'll eat, I'll eat whatever you're making. <laughs> And so Ty's making food, he's writing poems, and now it's time for him to go. It's about a, he doesn't go at the year mark, it's about a year and a half, almost two years. And Texas, they, they give you a date, you know, it's a year and a half down the road. And Ty said, hey man, I was talking with my lawyer, and he thinks it'd be good if you could sort of write me up something. And I was like, I'm just a poet. And so he was like, come and talk to my lawyer. Tell him what I've been doing. And I was like, okay. So he was like, I'm gonna meet with his lawyer. His lawyer's like, hey, write that, write that up. And he was like, and I want you to come and meet the judge. Now you have to understand, I'm 24 years old. And I remember going in there and I said, Ty, I'm gonna do my best. And I remember going in with my letter that I took days and days and agonized over and met with the judge. And I just talked about Todd's poems. I talked about his love for cooking. We didn't know what was gonna happen. We're in the court, we're in the courtroom. I get called out to the side a little later and his lawyer was like, that meant so much to the judge. He's changed the sentence essentially and put him in rehab. And me and Ty would write throughout rehab. I still have those letters. And so when I think about a prize like this, right, this is absolutely necessary. Ty Speed now is a caterer. <laughs> and we, every now and then we just talk about, he got two kids, I got a kid. And I just think about like, this is what literature produces. These are those intersections, right? I have in this poem, Lord, let me be alive and open. There's a way in which Ty taught me how to be alive and open. And so I thank you, Dwayne. I thank you, the National Book Award, National Book Foundation. I thank all the partners for believing in a project like this and for allowing us as Americans who are out here to see the absolute necessity of this thing. Thank you. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, the very first decision I made after I got sentenced uh, was to be a writer. And, um, and I made that decision in the face of having no clue that this was even possible. And I made that decision having no idea of the number of writers across this country who had made similar decisions and who had decided in the making of those decisions that the lives of other people mattered. There's another group of people who have made the very same decision. I consider myself an honorary member of this particular gang. They will hunt you down. Don't owe them money. I'm talking about your public librarians. 
You know, the last book I checked out from the public librarian was Evelyn Wood's Guide to Speed Reading. You cannot tell me I am not on brand. And this particular librarian that I call the stage, Andrea Smith, reminds me of something. Some of the people who are closest to God that we know are people who show up for those who are least loved. And from the very beginning, I mean, we've been working with Minnesota for years. Andrea has been a vibrant, energetic, committed partner. This is why I understood completely why when somebody was like, you know who's great? <laughs> Andrea's great. I was like, this is no surprise. But she joins other librarians who are absolutely fantastic. Corinne Leon in New York, um, Brandy Bonifay in California. I mean, the Department of Corrections has a number of amazing people working there, despite all the criticisms that we lodge at the Department of Corrections, because the reality is that for any system in this country to function, whether it's loving or horrendous, it is going to be undergirded by people who look just like you, who go to the same stores that you go to, who suffer the same horrors that you suffer. And we will begin this conversation about what it takes to bring this into prisons. We actually begin it with working with the people in the Department of Corrections. I understand that we live in a world that wants to create dissent and wants to name enemies. I want to name friends. And it was a librarian in the Department of Corrections who made sure I had access to the library. It was a CEO who made sure that when they said, should Shahid Duane work in the law library, he said yes, and he could have said no. So when I invite Andrea to the stage, I invite Andrea knowing that this happened because a lot of officials in the Department of Corrections believed that what we as writers had to say, whether or not it supported every decision they made was a value. And everybody here should remember this because we don't build a new America. When Albie said that we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Albie Sachs in South, Carolina, in South Africa, when he said that, he said because we have tortured people too. And I stand here today to say that what was most powerful about this was being in the presence of people who have wronged others and say, I am proud to be able to be something else today, even if the something else is a judge, because they don't let us judge once we've been judged. Andrea Smith to the stage. Like totally fine until that. Thank you. How come none of you guys have to use these? <laughs> um, my name is Andrea Smith, and I'm the senior librarian with the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I have worked with the department for nearly 20 years. All of them have been at the women's facility, MCF Shakopee. Um, it's our state's only facility for women. What I have learned. Um, in my years is that prison is both a place and a time. It is context and season like writ large. Um, there's that expression that there isn't a place for that, there isn't a time for that, we don't have time for anything these days. And when I love my job, because one of the best parts, when I love it, it's because prison is the time and the place for the thing. Um, finally, it's the time and the place for growth and for care and for considering something new, for trying something new, um, and for choosing something good over and over and over again. This is a true story for many of the women I've crossed paths with at Shakopee. The Shakopee is their time and place. And it comes with a sense of urgency for them. Um, most of the most of the time that is something that only people on the inside get to see, so you have to be there to see how this time and place is transformative. But the Inside Literary Prize is a chance for everyone to see. You're about to hear from six of our 25 judges in their own words reflecting on their experience. You get to hear and see what I get to see and hear in these discussions. Um, this is their voice getting out. And I want to be clear, these reflections are hard-earned. They did not just read four books and cast a ballot. 
They read and they discussed with specificity. And then they had questions, so they reread and they came back together and they had more questions and then they reread and they came together and then they cast a ballot after a contentious debate. <laughs> they entered into the experience with an open mind and a commitment to the process because it was their integrity at stake. This was their chance <clears throat> to make one vote for something permanent and lasting. I don't know what this means for recidivism, but I do know what it means for my community. It means hope, it means words matter, it means stories matter, and people matter, and it means that we're listening. Thank you. What I learned most from this process um, really was deciding about voting, what it means to vote and how you decide. You know, is, are you deciding on the best literary um, art piece or are you deciding on the book that needs to be read or that you feel needs to be read and heard and spoken about? The uh, Haunting of Haji Hotak. Because I'm a first generation Hmong American woman and daughter, um, there was a lot of things in that book that I could relate to. Uh, just from the son's point of view, uh, and also just being able to like see it sort of like from my parents' perspective, just differently. Uh, when it came to the war, when it came to, you know, uh, your grandmother, his mom, wishing to go back to, to the old country, um, and like the old traditions that still follow you, that's still there. I really like the uh, Best Barbarian because I told Miss Smith, I was like, it made me feel something. I was like, if I had to pick, um, my favorite poetry book, it would have been that one. South to America, I have not had a book make me that emotional where, like, I think I cried during some of our discussions about that book. And, you know, I'm a mom of biracial children, and so a lot of it touched home. Like, you know, I worry about my children growing up, what they're going to deal with as being biracial and being children of color. And so a lot of that just hit home and she just, her writing style is just so amazing. And, you know, she's telling stories, but she's telling more than a story. And she's giving us so much information that people just need to know. I was hooked from the very beginning because she didn't, um, she didn't give away the ending. It was, it was, it was a lot of back and forth. And I know that a lot of people weren't happy with all the extra characters, like, why are they even here? Because at the end, it all wraps it together. It was a very um, unique way to, to do what she did. And I really appreciated her book. I appreciated her book so much that I sent it to my 17-year-old daughter, who is absolutely enthralled. <laughs> the book is, it can be like, it's a form of art. You can send a message to someone, whether it be a message of, of information of how to survive, how to do something differently, how to think differently. Um, and it can also like make you feel things that you weren't feeling before. I feel like the English language does not adequately describe what I have been through. And I have to create that because it's my experience. And reading books like my favorite, South to South America, I realized you can I think it's it's common that people use history to kind of use those words and explain their pain and, and even the happiness or, or whatever it is. Um, and even then it's not adequate. It still doesn't fully explain it. And yet when it's beautifully put together, like in South America, it not only gives you hope, um, but it gives you this sense of connection with people you may never have had that connection with. Being a judge for ILP, like it just, meant a lot for me like it meant that my voice mattered because for the last four and a half years my voice hasn't mattered this is where i'm gonna cry <laughs> um you know i got to be i got to be chelsea i wasn't just my number we we're in here yes we're padlocked but we have ideas and thoughts that really matter You know, um, 
One of the things you have to actually ask yourself is what truly is the function of leadership? And you have to ask yourself if you understood the function of literature before a day like today. Um, being comfortable, I think, allows you to forget the discomforted. And, um, and today we got to get a close look at how literature comforts those who are in need of comfort, right? And, and how it asks us to think differently about what our lives might become. 1997. February 1997, February 19th to be exact, I got sent to the Fairfax County Jail. I was 16 years old. It's a devastating for me now because my son is 16 and my son weighs maybe 120 pounds and he weighs more than I did when I was sent to the Fairfax County Jail and I was placed in solitary confinement. For nine days, I had not a mattress, not a blanket, not a pillow, not a sheet. I had a concrete slab to sleep on and I was 16 years old. Nine days later, the nurse came to make sure I was healthy, to send me to general population, and the nurse realized that I smelled like a 16-year-old who hadn't taken a shower in nine days. The nurse demanded that the COs give me my property, and they brought me my property, and the thing that delighted me most was James Baldwin's short story collection. I read the whole thing in one night. Baldwin was, once wrote an essay to prisoners. And he talked about the creativity that was locked inside of a cage. And he talked about the possibility. But what Baldwin also talks about in one of the most amazing languages ever produced in the English language in Notes of a Native Son was how violence destroys. And a violence that destroys isn't just a violence that's enacted, enacted by the hands of your oppressor. But the violence that destroys is also the violence that's enacted by your hand. And I like to think that um, one of the most humbling things about this tour, about doing this work with men and women in prison who understand what it means to have regrets, is that the literature made each of them understand those regrets in a much more profound way. And I think made us, seriously, understand their humanity, understand our own humanity in ways that we don't often contemplate. And so I wanna, I wanna say that like the winner will receive $4,860. Buys a lot of soups in prison. But that represents 1,800 hours at 54 cents an hour. A friend of mine, I sent him a Bonnie Perry's book. And his response was to start a book club. This was the Lorraine Hansberry book. I told him about this prize and he was disappointed that Virginia was not amongst the states that would be judges. When I tell him that the winner of the first Inside Literary Prize is Amani Perry. Uh, he will be delighted, uh, not just because he's read your work, but because he read your work before you wrote about the life that you've lived and about some of what inspires your work. And uh, it is actually, <laughs> it is a delightful honor to um, invite you to the stage to accept the first Inside Literary Prize. children told me I always got to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I remember the envelope stamped with the names of correctional facilities, and then the long letters in tight script written on yellow loose leaf paper that sat on my father's desk. He wrote long letters back, his penmanship looser, because paper wasn't as precious a commodity for him. What I would do to have those letters now filled with paragraphs of freedom dreams. Loved ones behind bars taught him more than his doctorate from Yale did about the way the world worked and how to believe in justice and to have faith in a righteous social contract yet unseen. I am Steve Whitman's child, and therefore I am the child of his teachers on the inside, just as I am the descendant of the shackled and Jim Crow. From my father, I learned that a society that solves its problems and or serves its greed by locking people in cages has failed in a core tenet of humanism. Dostoevsky wrote, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. Well, our prisons are blacker, browner, poorer, more disabled, more sick, more feel, filled with survivors of violence and trauma than average American places, a sign that being mistreated, disadvantaged, and wounded are punished in our nation. I would therefore modify Dostoevsky's words slightly to say that if you want an honest judgment of the incivility of our society, you must listen to its prisoners. I am listening. In this honor, I renew my sense of responsibility to the millions of people incarcerated and under state supervision, not as a matter of charity, but rather out of the deepest respect for the insight that comes from seeing society from the corners that it keeps hidden and for the wisdom of those whom it keeps out of view, and most of all, out of care for those in the grasp of confinement. I think this prize is most of all a recognition of readers, and may this recognition of the intellectual life that exists behind bars extend much further to recognition that we need quality health care and facilities for people locked up, to ending employment discrimination for former prisoners, to granting full rights to social services and and suffrage for those who have been incarcerated and their families to a resounding public call for providing the kind of health care, social safety net, living wages, decent housing, quality education, and resources for the poor that would prevent the vast majority of people currently incarcerated from having ever set foot inside a jail, much less a prison. God bless the organizers who believe in freedom. And to the people inside, please know when I say we, and when I refer to my people, I mean you too. Thank you. I, you know, it's funny. Um, I am literally, I am only supposed to not say one thing. <laughs> I'm so disrespectful. We're going to do this again because my mom didn't show up. <laughs> now we'll see, we'll get back to you guys. But, uh, but what I find delightful about this actually is the whole country should see this. I, I actually do think that um, as somebody who served a lot of time in prison, nine years, and somebody who mom, like most Americans, don't believe anything val of value comes out of prison. I mean, we don't live in a society that actually, actually reinforces that notion. Quiet as kept, every successful thing I've done in this life has been because people don't give me opportunities because I got a felony conviction. That does not make me brilliant. It does not make me a genius. It makes me desperate. And the fact that we have a society that imagines that it can remain what it aspires to when it pushes people solely through desperation to try to make a way when none exists, it's not a blueprint for success. Tonight has been successful. My life has been successful because of a countless number of people that believe that possibility should be nurtured, should be nourished, and should be awarded with dessert. <laughs> And so now we have to get out soon, but I want to thank Tony Marks. 
I want to thank the New York Public Library. This is a beautiful space. I want to thank you all, and I want to say that this has been one of the most amazing nights of my life. Good night. <laughs>